Hey YouTube, welcome back to the second episode in the Thayer Problem. Reminder, if you want a lesson with me, check the link in the description and we'll work something out and you can get a lesson with me and that'd be super cool. Let's talk about how the Thayer Problem has been solved. So some of you may know the infinity valve um, as advertised by Bach. This looks a lot like one because, well, it is one. Um, they're made by Mike Olson of Instrument Innovations. Uh, Mike, if you didn't know, uh, you know, runs a machine shop and does a bunch of machining and stuff, used to make the axial valves for Edwards. And he did all that work for a long time. Eventually kind of came up with his own designs and wanted to kind of break away and make his own stuff. Valves and other stuff as well. Um, a couple examples of other things are like this whole system of the adjustable F um, arm. It's adjustable in like basically every way. You can move this. You can change the throw of this. You can move the pivot point here, like up and down and side to side. Well, I guess that's it. Well, all that stuff is adjustable, which is huge because previous systems were just like one piece, one bar, and you just had to hope that you would get everything about it correct to make the throw good. Now let's get down to the crux of the issue, which is the Thayer valve, right? We talked about this last time, basically, you know, this on a normal Thayer, and I don't have one anymore, it's gone. Um, this will just come in, there's no extra um, cylindrical part here, it's just the cone, and the bearings at the end are the part that fails. And this is an infinity valve part, so it's not gonna help, um, because it's just metal on metal and it doesn't really work. The same thing on this end as well, the spindle bearing. Now what Mike came up with to fix this problem, both on axials like this and his own rotor design, all are uh, ball bearings. And if you don't know what they are, basically you have a little track like this, a bunch of little tiny metal balls, and then another track on the inside. And instead of the metal just moving against metal, it's the balls inside the track that are actually doing all of the moving. Ball bearings are used in basically every application of circle movement <laughs> in the world. Like they're in your um, wheel hubs on your car. They're on a bunch of different things on your car. They're in like all sorts of industrial applications. They're everywhere. They're kind of, you know, if not the best way, one of the best ways to eliminate a lot of friction and a lot of wear on parts that have to move in a circle. Now, instead of the cone continuing all the way down, we have instead the cylindrical section, I talked about that, and that is the spot where the ball bearing is. Um, just a little thing like this, and then a little track on the inside with little balls in it. And so instead of just the end of the valve core just spinning on metal, it has a little track or a little, uh, a little ball bearing set that goes on the end of this that slips into the valve casing right here. And you can see on this infinity valve core, instead of the cone extending all the way to the end, there's a fitting for that ball bearing on the end. Um, the ball bearing is its own separate part that will slip on here and you can change the ball bearings in and out if they go bad. So what's neat is no, not only is there a ball bearing on that end, just a little track, the ball's in it. There's one on the spindle end as well. Obviously, it's not quite as obvious on this. It's a different size than the one on this end, um, but it's kind of set into this little raised part right here where the, the uh, bumpers are. Basically, this means that instead of the valve kind of like touching a whole bunch of stuff at the same time, um, lots of like metal on metal contact, it's almost floating um, on the ball bearings instead. Instead of touching a bunch of stuff, it's got very little friction inside and therefore can move um, much better. Now, one of the ways a valve will seal, of course, is that you don't want a bunch of air to escape on its way through these ports. And a leaky Thayer usually will leak at this end or at this end um, because the space between you know, either one of those ends and the valve casing is a little too large. There's like gaps in it. So the air will come out and it'll make it play bad, be out of tune, um, and usually have worse action as well. Now you might think because there's ball bearings that the 
since it's kind of floating on the ball bearings, that it's not going to seal as well. But the fact is, since there's a ball bearing here, this this uh, surface is totally good to go. There's not going to be a way for the air to escape via the cone. On the other end, um, this surface is also pretty good. And the fact of the matter is, a valve like this, even though it's floating on ball bearings that don't necessarily need uh, lubrication, um, you still have to oil this to give the oil get the oil around the valve, which actually makes the seal with the air. And I think at first uh, Mike said, oh, these don't need oil, so a lot of people didn't oil them. And they didn't like how they played, and it's because, well, they need the oil to actually seal on the surfaces like this one where there's no ball bearing or anything. Um, if there's no kind of like liquid there to make the seal and the seal isn't perfect against the casing, then, you know, it's just gonna leak and it's not gonna feel that good. So is this solution perfect? No, of course not. There's still ways to get it wrong. Um, honestly, I think Bach puts these sections together pretty badly on average. This has been custom made by my tech. This is actually his instrument, it's not mine. Um, and it plays really, really, really well. It's got great action. It's very smooth. It's, I mean, it's pretty quiet. You can hear the bumps here, but um, when you use it, it's pretty quiet. It's pretty light too, it's fast. Um, it seals, it's got a great low range, it's very even sounding. The ones on box are not always set up quite as well. Um, despite the fact that you have the ball bearings making things easier, so you don't have to have everything just be exactly right in the fit in the casing, it still takes a level that I think Bach either doesn't know how to do or they're not doing because they don't want to put in the time. That's why, as a rule, I would probably stay away from the infinity valve on Bach products, unless you play it first and you know it's really good. Um, I just, I haven't played a lot of these that were really good. Um, almost every single Bach 50 AF3, which is the version with two, um, you know, two axials, I, almost every single one, maybe one out of a dozen that I've played has actually been any good. The tenors seem to be better, uh, more consistent. Maybe uh, I've played like three or four that have been pretty good. But in general, I think these are best set up by a good tech who knows what they're doing. Now, is that any different than a normal Thayer? No, not really, but these are better valves. They will last longer, and because um, Mike Olson is in production right now, has a company that's in business, you can still get parts. Um, and what's cool is if a valve core goes bad or a uh, bearing goes bad or something, you just get a new one, have your tech install it, and you're good to go. So that's all I've got. This is the, the latest in axial valve technology. I think it's also the best so far. I know there's other um, stuff, modern stuff in like Europe. I think Hog makes some cool axials and there's something about them that's different too. But uh, if you want something that's easily accessible, actually quite cheap and as good as it gets in the United States, the Infinity slash Olsen axial valve is the way to go. See you guys next time.